Well, baked into that 300 billion that you referred to are the subsidies for uh, renewables. One of the interesting things about the nuclear industry is that they, they're not asking for subsidies. Here's, a, uh, here's James Voss, the Managing Director of Ultra Safe Nuclear Australia at a Senate hearing last month. Listen to this. We believe that the owners of these reactors should be fully responsible for all costs of operation, including decommissioning, site restoration and waste disposal. We believe that the people of Australia should not be subsidizing any part of such development, particularly since all of these developments are now off the shelf. There is no development for the most part that is needed. Scott, how can an Australian energy minister ignore something like that? Exactly. And of course, what's happening is there's now calls for even more subsidies for renewables and nuclear power stations and indeed baseload coal-fired power stations could continue to operate um, uh, reliably and with a, a fi secure financial base if it wasn't for the fact that subsidised renewables were coming in, cutting their lunch, sometimes the price is zero, but then the wind stops blowing and, and it peaks again. So you haven't got a stable financial base for these things. So end all of the subsidies and baseload energy like coal-fired or nuclear just takes care of itself. That's what we have to do. End all of those subsidies for renewables. And then Australians won't be freezing in the dark, which is where we're heading. Now, before we go, Scott, you've got a piece coming up in The Spectator this week. Uh, it's, a, it's a unique angle on the voice debate. It's a, the implications for the separations of power. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, I'll just do it briefly, Fred. Great magazine, of course, The Spectator. Big shout out we to love Ryan it. Dean. We love it, and, yep. And it was prompted really by, you may recall, Justice Harrison of the New South Wales Supreme Court uh, wrote an impassioned email, a very um, improper email to a uh, federal coalition MP denouncing a speech that he'd made in Parliament for being about the voice for being racist. Now, this is a, a breach of the separation of powers. And once you start talking about the separation of powers, you come to the issue that the voice to Parliament is itself something that would destroy that principle in our Constitution. It will be a whole new chapter in the Constitution. There's only eight chapters in the Constitution, and this referendum, if it was successful, would insert a new one, Chapter 9, solely concerned with the voice to Parliament. Where would it sit within those, that, those separated powers in our constitution? Ah, well, that's exactly the question, Fred. Justice Isaacs, who was Chief Justice, later Governor General, made it very clear. He said, look, Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3 spells out the Parliament, the Judiciary and the Executive. There's your separation of powers right there. All other institutions must conform to one or the other. So we've had that as settled doctrine since 1915, at least in Australia. It's a 300 year old doctrine. And along comes the voice to parliament, which doesn't sit within any of those, which has its own powers. Uh, it, it has the ability to influence the executive, uh, inf influence the parliament, and it's gonna be decided by the high court. This is absolutely uncharted territory, a wrecking ball through the constitution. As if there wasn't enough that we didn't know about this voice to parliament. I'll be voting no. I'll, I'll let you know that right now. Scott Hargraves, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Fred. That's the Institute of Public Affairs Executive Director, Scott Hargraves.